Well, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> I'm, I'm Michael Hudson, the uh, new director of the Middle East Institute at the National University of Singapore. And uh, I am very happy to be officiating at uh, this, uh, our latest uh, event in a calendar that we hope will be filled with uh, interesting uh, lectures, seminars, workshops uh, on, on various aspects of the Middle East. Uh, many of you may know, but some of you may not know, that uh, the scope of the Middle East Institute's interests runs from politics and security issues to matters relating to economics, business, and development, to the area of culture, uh, classical culture, popular culture, uh, and, and social issues. So it is our intention in the coming months to be presenting a series of events of one sort or another that cover some of these broad areas. Uh, we're also uh, intending, uh, in keeping with our mandate, to focus on, on hot topics, on uh, issues of uh, burning importance in the region today. And that's why uh, we are sponsoring what we think could be a very interesting lecture on Friday on Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan might not seem to you to be in the Middle East, but our Middle East is expanding all the time, and there are plenty of good reasons why uh, we should have an interest in Afghanistan, given, as you all know, I think, the, the uh, genealogy of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and the connections between uh, the Middle East uh, and, uh, and that uh, far distant country. So we've invited uh, Professor uh, Rais, uh, Wahabuddin uh, Rais, from the Political Science Department at the Islamic University in Kuala Lumpur, uh, who is an Afghan, to come down. And he'll be speaking uh, Friday afternoon, not here at, uh, in this part of town, but it's down at the main campus, the Kent Ridge campus of NUS. And you have, I think, probably some written information about that lecture. But let me turn to the lecture we are looking forward to uh, this afternoon. And before I introduce the lecturer, let me just say a, a brief word about the topic, which uh, is one of great interest to me. Uh, the topic is political leadership in the Middle East. And for more years than I care to remember, I've been studying the politics of the region, and uh, I have uh, tried to focus in part on the question of leadership, partly because, strange as it seems, leadership is a rather understudied uh, concept in Middle East politics. That's strange because I think we all know that uh, most of the regimes, most of the political systems in the region are authoritarian uh, and often governed in a, in a very uh, comprehensive way uh, without much contradiction by leaders, by individual leaders uh, uh, who clearly have some kind of uh, uh, power and influence and authority. So I think one of the interesting things, one of the interesting challenges for political scientists working in the region is to examine more than we have in the past the phenomenon of leadership itself. Who are these leaders? How do they get to where they were? What is the nature of their upbringing, their socialization, their, their ideology, their personality, and so forth? But going beyond that, to try to situate these leaders in their states, in their regimes, in their societies, and in their culture, to try and understand how it is, uh, or whether it, it is, that these leaders govern with any degree of legitimacy. Uh, this is, there's no simple answer to this question, and I think our speaker today, uh, if I uh, understand uh, him correctly, will be trying to explore some of the nuances of leadership in the region, and uh, I think attempt, uh, in fact, uh, a, a uh, typology or a taxonomy 
of leadership, which I think would be most welcome. Professor Rahman, Professor Atar Rahman, uh, we are very fortunate that he's been visiting MEI for the last uh, couple of months, and he'll be with us uh, at least uh, through September, uh, through December. Uh, he's a senior visiting research fellow with us, and uh, he comes with quite a uh, distinguished academic uh, pedigree. He has been working previously as a senior fellow uh, for the Japan Foundation at the Graduate School of International Development in Nagoya University, Japan. Uh, he's a graduate, he's a professor, a distinguished professor from Dhaka University in Bangladesh. And he comes with an American graduate education, an MA and PhD from uh, the University of Chicago, which uh, is certainly one of the, probably one of the top 10 uh, or even top five universities in the United States uh, in the area of the uh, social sciences and the humanities. He has taught and conducted research at London University, at the United Nations University Leadership Academy in Jordan, at George Washington University and Eckerd College in the United States. He has won a number of uh, important awards and fellowships, including Fulbright Fellowships, a Ford Foundation Fellowship, a Japan Foundation Fellowship, and he is quite widely published with many articles in uh, scholarly uh, international journals. And he occasionally uh, writes uh, op-ed pieces for uh, outlets such as Newsweek, uh, The Washington Post, and the BBC. So uh, he comes, I think, with, uh, with uh, a very interesting scholarly background. And uh, I am looking forward to his uh, uh, opening up, or reopening up, the subject of leadership in the region. So following our usual custom, uh, Professor Rahman will uh, lecture for as long as he chooses to. And then uh, we will open up the floor for some uh, comments and questions. And afterwards, uh, I hope that there will be some coffee and tea available uh, for all of us. Thank you very much. Distinguished Chair, uh, of course you are here, and uh, Michael Craig Hudson, Director of Middle East Institute, Ambassador Bagis Matthews, and distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. I'm indeed very pleased and privileged to talk on such a topic today this afternoon. At the outset, uh, on a personal note, I would like to mention that uh, 14 years ago, I had the opportunity to work on Singapore governance at uh, the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies. I was inspired by the country's enlightened and visionary leadership. Subsequently, I joined the United Nations University Le Leadership in Amman, Jordan, to conduct a research on regional leadership for two years. The academy was founded by King Hussein of Jordan, a remarkable moderate Arab leader of the region who played a critical role in the Oslo Accord in 1993. I was able to observe some of the momentous happenings in the aftermath of 9-11 that culminated in the Second Gulf War. Today's lecture will, I think, uh, will gain or it will be based on some of the insights that I gained in working in the region for the last, uh, for, the, for two years. Uh, let me begin by answering the question, why leadership in Middle East, does it really matter? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, 
Uh, let me also start with the proposition that the Middle East today is at a critical turning point. While peace and security elude the region for a long time, political succession, transition, and transformation of leadership has assumed new significance. Iraq, devastated by two wars, is in now on the road to a new form of transition, or new mode of transition, from Saddam Hussein's dictatorial rule to an unstable coalition made by or you know, uh, initiated by fragmented and divided parties on the basis of Shia, Sunni, and Kurdish identities. If we look at Iran, the current uh, theocratic and ambitious political leadership is under challenge, both by its dom domestic forces as well as by Western powers. So the Arabia's current king, Abdullah, is now 86. Still, the succession is not yet clear. Egypt's President Hosni Mubarak, in his 82, and uh, his political succession is most likely to put his son, Gamal Mubarak, in, in his place in the next election to be held uh, next year. Nobody knows uh, what will happen to Muammar Gaddafi of Libya, who has been eternally ruling Libya more than 40 years now. The same is the case almost with President uh, Abdullah Saleh of Yemen after 32 years. So this is the number one reason that uh, it's in a transition. The second, if we look at the political leadership why it matters in the Middle East more than any other region, for a number of reasons. The region is deeply embedded in conflicts along divisive identities. Second, power is highly concentrated in the hands of leaders, whether they're kings, amirs, sheikhs, presidents, or prime ministers, or supreme leaders. Political institution is mostly non-participatory. Civil society is weak, fragmented, and controlled. Print media is not free to the extent uh, desirable. And charisma is built on a single leader. And alternative, alternative leadership is difficult to grow. Uh, particularly through an open participatory process. As a result, political succession becomes a critical factor, paving the way for either dynastic rule or chaos or instability. In fact, if we look at some of the contemporary events, like the cruel assassination of Rufiq Harari, Prime Minister Rufiq Harari in Lebanon in 2005, a serious disruptive event that affected Lebanon's political history in 2005, a serious disruptive event that affected uh, its course. His son, Saad Hariri, was catapulted to political leadership. Similarly, King Abdullah of Jordan succeeded his father, King Hussein, in 1999 at the deathbed, although his brother, King Hassan, was, a, was the crown prince for a long time. The current Syrian President Bashar al-Assad was another case of dynastic succession after the death of his father, President uh, Hafez al-Assad, uh, who ruled as a military and political leader for three decades. An evaluation of the performance of uh, the departing leaders and the succession of the new, their outlook and socialization are therefore important in understanding how the region will evolve in the future. The distinguished participants, three weeks ago, in a lecture on the Middle East Day, Professor Michael Hudson characterized the region as a contradiction, echoing in the same vein 
I would like to argue in my presentation that political leadership in the Middle East is a cruel paradox. This paradox is created by the fascination of the people of the region for leaders as heroes, charismatic, courageous, and determined, no matter who they are, tribal chiefs, kings, nationalist, Arab nationalist, Islamist, or terrorist. If they are able to lead people on some perceived legitimate grounds and can infuse ideological values, people rally behind them in tens of thousands in times of crisis and change. Ironically, leaders often fail them. They use and mislead people, legitimize and perpetuate their own power and control with iron hands. The salience of political leadership in the Middle East has therefore assumed a new significance. It's nonetheless regrettable, as Professor Hudson has said, that there is a dearth of books or good publication on the subject. Out of 3,000 books which I had the privilege to scan in the Middle East Institute in Singapore, I found only one book published in 1990, which is a kind of biographical dictionary, and three books on biographies, one on King Faisal, another on King Hussein of Jordan, another Yasser Arafat. So the rationale for undertaking this type of effort, or my endeavor, is to fill the deficit in Middle East leadership study. Uh, I understand and realize my limitations in exploring this fascinating uh, but uh, complex leadership phenomena across the region. But I would be benefited uh, from the interactions and feedback from you in my future effort. I have structured my lecture, today's lecture, in four parts. One, first of all, I shall analyze the context and basis of leadership. The second, I would like to construct a profile of leadership, identifying the types, characteristics, succession, socialization, and behavioral patterns of leadership. Third, I have an evaluation of the performance of leadership on three criteria, peace and security, regional leadership balance, and economic cooperation within the region and beyond. And fourth and final, I want to discuss future outlook of leadership development in the region. With this, uh, let me now turn to, for a moment, on the theoretical framework of my presentation. Uh, so I just, uh, because the PowerPoint was available, so I just, uh, the four, uh, three assumptions, uh, I nuanced some assumptions of traditional, transitional, and transformational theories of leadership, focusing on regime change which is of long interest in political science and international politics. The stereotype categorization of authoritarian or patrimonial leadership are reconsidered by looking at socialization and change process. So my assumption of traditional leadership focuses on the notion of power distance between the leader and the follower, consistent with values of hierarchy, order, family, and social bonds. Second, my assumption of transitional leadership is seen as going from a known to an unknown, bridging from the old while looking towards the new as a process of remaking the past tradition-bound relations and structures, including religious values and practices. So leaders, followers, exchange, and process of socialization is a key const uh, key uh, is key in this construct. And finally, I assume that transformation is a change in structure, purpose, goals, and behavior, a new order of inspiring and exceptional leadership. Tradition is replaced through transiting 
to new types of motivation. And in theory, they said it idealized influence, inspiration and lead, intellectual stimulation, and new mission of leaders and for followers with increased connectivity. And, uh, but before that, uh, let me now, uh, my first argument is that uh, leadership emerged in a context. And the context is very important in leadership. And so I just want to focus on the context in the Middle East. And I said uh, that it's a daunting context in the Middle East. So leadership is critical, uh, particular context in the emergence of leaders in any society, of course. This is not only in the Middle East, but across the board, uh, state, region, because how leaders manipulate context in creative ways, in the direction of their choosing, affects the history of that region or the nation. And as you know very well, that multiplicity of challenges are the defining character of the Middle East. And the region, in this region, perhaps you can get uh, almost every problem that could face a leader will be found in the region at a high degree of severity and intensity. So leadership context in the Middle East, therefore, daunting, as they are good, they, because it is the outcome of long historical, political, religious, cultural, as well as interventionist policy of the Western powers. So the historical predicament of wars, colonization by the Western powers, especially the French and the British, and subsequent American hegemony provided the main ground for the rise of nationalist and founding leaders, as well as religious, political, and other leaders, or social leaders of varied movements and extremist activities in recent decades. The struggle, which is very important, against outside powers is the principal dynamic of leadership in the region. And it seems to be repeating in the region. Just to uh, give a very quick summation, which I said in the last, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, coinciding with the World War I, French and British occupation, World War II, led to the rise of leaders of four different types. One monarchic and traditional leaders in, leaders in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf region, epitomized best by King Abdul Aziz of Saudi Arabia and his successors. The second, the nationalist military leaders in Egypt and Syria, represented best by Gamal Abdul Nasser and Hafez al-Assad. And third, determined Jewish leaders, like David Ben-Gurion, founder of Israel, and Ariel Sharon. And fourth, Anglo-Soviet installed an US-backed rule of the last emperor of Iran, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi. So that's the background uh, of the historical context. Second, I think uh, this economic context is also very important. And I think uh, we should know the contradictions in the Arab region in terms of economy. is clearly exemplified in its economic indicators. Affluence and poverty characterize the region, and they're conspicuously visible in income disparity, unemployment, human poverty, with striking regional variations. The average income of the people varies from 2,300 in Yemen to 92,000 in Qatar. The low-income group countries are Yemen, Morocco, Jordan, Syria, Egypt, and Palestine, where about 25% people live in economic insecurity, Unemployment rate is very high, and human poverty, education, health, and political freedoms are low. In fact, more than 50 million people live under conditions of absolute poverty in the region. And then the third characteristic is that in high-income countries like Gulf, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, fairly wide and deep social nets are provided now with quasi-modern social security arrangement. But income gaps are high and human development index is less satisfactory. Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, UAE, and Saudi Arabia are making good progress, but deprivations are still deep, and reforms often come in half-hearted manners without uh, bringing intended outcomes or result. Now, the second context, uh, very quickly, I just want to mention that cultural religious context is very important also. 
because Middle East is the home of three great religions, Judaism, Christian, and Islam, that coexisted for 1,000 years in conflict as well as cooperation, acting as the social basis of leadership and providing the principal dynamic of state formation in the region. Recent decades have witnessed mounting social and political mobilization along Islamic lines against secular policies of the 20th century as integral to politics and governance reality of the region. Second, rapid urbanization, demographic revolution, tilting the population to the young, 38% below 15, increasing literacy, deepening media exposures have catapulted the re more religious, lower strata of the society onto the political scene. And with lack of democratic institutions and part participation, resulting in significant gaps and frustration led to the rise of underground activism, violence, and terrorism, often expressed in Islamic terms. And third, Islamic leaders and movements have become attractive now more than ever before in articulating the political aspirations of the politicized, semi-urbanized, and often marginalized groups who find secular leaders in government, state positions, having ties with Western powers and interests, less imaginative and supportive for their cause. Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Salvation Party, Islamic Action Party, Islamic Liberation Party, all illustrate this point. And uh, I just want to uh, give you the leadership basis, which is um, important. And in Middle East, now this has emerged on two main tracks, state and society, or streets, as they call it, with conflicting as well as converging goals and interests. So state-centric leadership, arising from historical state formation and driven by military and political forces, resulting in monarchies, kingdoms, rulers, president, prime minister, or supreme leaders, consulted and assisted by other leaders of state institution as top-down political parties. And founding leadership in most states come from courageous tribal and military rulers, creating partly as the instrument for legitimacy and consolidation of power and uh, elaborate structures of security and intelligence agency to contain dissidents and opponents. And the second stream, or the second base, is the societal leadership. Which is uh, arising from, which is now arising from societal, ideational, and religious divisions and fragmentation of the Arab region. The Arab culture and religion encourage unity, but divisiveness pull Arab society between all sorts of polarities and conflicting orientations. Now, more than ever, impacting on the development of prototypical leadership ideas, movements, and struggles. In fact, the leadership of these movements, religious groups, semi-political parties, underground activists, and terrorists provide the main challenge to state-centric leadership for e inventing or recreating societies or states. Now, I have also given uh, some types of leadership. I just wanted to play with some of the leadership types typology and model. So uh, uh, it's oversimplifying the reality. I just uh, tried it uh, so you can have some of the dynamics of st So some of the models I just uh, played with, with the dynamics of state formation, state building, and social forces that led to complex and evolving leadership pattern and are divided in several types or models. So one is, I tried to say, is a specific Saudi and Gulf model, uh, which is undergoing significant transition starting from the Wahhabi Islamic principles of piety, highly pragmatic, modern outlook, enterprising, and legitimacy comes from welfare measures now for the citizens with enhanced capacity in terms of resource distribution and institutional growth, and at the same time exercising utmost control. So this is one model. The second model is Egyptian-Syrian model, 
where you see you can also compare with the Lebanon, Jordan, you know, that type of thing, but particularly Jordan and other, Yemen. So this type, more transitional type, long innings in power, most of the leaders, and uh, facing tremendous domestic pressures along ec economic, social context, and Islamic lines with radicalization of opposition forces and disaffected groups. Less capacity in terms of resources, but more controlling regimes. And then I just wanted to put Palestinian as the sole model, a bit exclusive, divided and fragmented, faced with enormous pressures from militant political and social groups along Palestinian, Arab, Islamic identities, and historical anti-Jewish stance. And then finally, I thought we have now a new Iranian model, which is transitional, theocratic, ambitious, and controlling, continuously playing the Islamic identity vis-a-vis -vis the Western power in political and social mobilization for legitimacy and the consolidation of power. Now, I just have a quick uh, look at uh, some of the profiling of the leaders. So the Yemen, because uh, they're in the same geographical uh, boundary. And so you can see King Abdulaziz, the founder, and then King Faisal, King Abdullah, and of course, the Yemen, uh, President Saleh. So I, I have, uh, and then I just made some uh, characteristics of these leaders, but you know most of them. So King Abdulaziz, I think uh, the longest serving 50 years, and uh, the most courageous statesmen and far-sightedness far united the scattered regions and feuding tribe. So I think uh, this tradition is very important in understanding the faith in Islam and maintaining Arab tradition. So King Faisal is more a state uh, admin initiated reforms in economic and administrative, so he was mainly a state building capacity. And then Abdullah came with a more uh, open, uh, liberal face in terms of trying to implement uh, some of the, uh, because uh, this is very important. And then out of Gulf, I think uh, I thought uh, this leadership also resembles the Saudi with some differences. The prominent, prominent Gulf states now exhibit a new dynamism in their development state building, and also state building. Succession of leadership is emerging, intriguing, but peaceful and shared within the narrow ruling, like a Maktoum dynasty in, uh, in, Do, uh, in uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, in the, uh, Dubai. And then we have uh, Abu Dhabi, the rich Muslim Qadashi. Uh, Abu Dhabi is Nahyan, Sheikh Zayed al-Nahyan, and his son, Khalifa uh, Nahyan. So we have these profiles of leaders from Gulf, Kuwait, Qatar, Bahrain. So they follow the same track within the family, tribal, but shared within the family leadership, but more modern and uh, enlightened face, mm. but uh, keeping the tradition uh, at the source. And now we have this uh, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon. So we have this profile up, and you can see from uh, Gamal Abdul Nasser to the new leaders also. Uh, three main leaders after Rafiq Hariri, uh, son Saad Hariri, Abdullah, and then Bashar al-Assad. Now, I have some description, but I couldn't uh, help uh, talking something about uh, Nasser, a great Arab leader is, who showed courage, not only in nationalizing Shu'a, but a symbol of Arab nationalism, whose voices were there in the streets of Arabs, you know, and uh, fought two wars with Israel, but always playing the card of the people. So that's another. And then Anwar Sadat, who was a, who turned from uh, a kind of uh, nationalist to kind of peace, opted for peace and signed the Camp David Accord, but assassinated at the end. So I think, and then we have the Hosni Mubarak, the kind of uh, the last pharaoh. So, President, uh, uh, so uh, Hosni Mubarak uh, is also now uh, continuing for 30 years, but remained committed to peace with Israel at a high cost of his credibility at home. 30 years, supported UN sanction, US action in Iraq that invaded Kuwait. 
a hybrid regime of state control through military bureaucracy. In so this is the model base. And Syria, Hafez al-Assad, I thought, uh, in the Syrian context, uh, he was also very strong and authoritarian in a type of a leader, but uh, also a state builder. And he uh, succeeded uh, um, very peacefully his son, succession. And I thought uh, one should also know about, uh, so I don't want to discuss the emergence of uh, women leaders. I didn't get much, but uh, I thought uh, to Hannah Ashadawi, because I used to see her often when I was in, after Intifada in Palestine. So she was very good in speaking and uh, very eloquent. Uh, Shabal al Arabiya, you know, she used to, I was so much charmed with the, the coining of the word, the way, you know, the so eloquent, you see, and spoke so well. And then we have the first uh, lady member of the parliament in Kuwait, uh, Masuma al Mubarak, you see. Uh, so you don't get uh, too many. In, and also this uh, education minister now, Nauria al Bith, you see, in uh, Kuwait, education minister and uh, center of controversy for many things but she emerged as a leader in the Arab world. We have also some other, like Chief Justice, uh, recently nominated. Uh, but uh, mainly p uh, political construct, we don't have much. You see. So I was trying to see that. Uh, and then we have the profiles of leader of Israel and Palestine. You see. David Ben-Gurion, he was the founder leader, not so democratic, but very strong and determined for Israeli nationhood. Yasser Arafat. Not democratic, but a charismatic leader. You see. And then Ariel Short, um, Sharon, you see, very ruthless, but sometimes very compromising, very contradictory. And then uh, we have also the new generation of leaders, you see, Netanyahu, Mahmoud Abbas, and Khaled Michel, you see, from the societal leadership of Hamas. So uh, that's another uh, current in Israel and Palestinian. So I just, uh, I had this, but I didn't want to discuss Ben Gurion, Errol Sharon, to begin. So there are other, you know, but uh, I didn't push it. And then Iran, you see, I think, uh, I thought it uh, deserves merit on, on its own, uh, the profiling of leader, you know, they look, uh, except to Ahmed Inazad, he looks slightly different, you see. But uh, Rafsanjani is more moderate than uh, some of those. So we have the moderate, and also very challenging leader, you see, uh, with uh, Ruhul Ayatollah Khomeini and then Khamenei, you see. They represent the supreme leaders. One is the founder of uh, a revolution, another is now sustaining the revolution as the leader. And the Rafsanjani, the moderate leader who, uh, from the parliament leader to the president and the so he has also a moderate voice, but Ahmadinejad more challenging. And then we have the Hassan Nasrullah, you see, who came uh, through this uh, Hezbollah in 1992, and then played a tremendous role in shaping uh, the Lebanon, Lebanese politics and also links with uh, Iran. So he also emerged as a permanent feature in Lebanese politics, despite uh, they don't have much for they don't have. But they ha he has the ultimate veto power in even Lebanese politics. So it's a semi-political party with military wing. You see. So the Hezbollah itself, there are so many studies. And, uh, so he's the leader, which is very much known. Now I also put in this construct uh, some of the succession and socialization of leadership. I know it's uh, difficult. So there are some I just wanted to uh, present that what are the issues which are being discussed. Uh, one is, uh, this was for a long time, there's a passionate debate in the Middle East uh, countries that uh, discourse in Islam also, that whether leaders are born or made, you see. We had a challenging, you see. So uh, some people say, no, leaders are born because they have the innate, uh, inherent qualities of leadership. And the, some said, it can be made. You know, so, that's, you know, so in Islam as a theoretical construct or in principle advocates traits or qualities, enduring traits or qualities as prerequisites of leadership. So Prophet Muhammad actually did not, that's why, uh, clearly indicate which way to go. It's a very smart thing. And even Ayatollah Khomeini didn't keep any succession very clearly. So because they wanted to keep that in the gray zone. So I think uh, 
the Arab, but the Arab society is more tilted in favor of uh, father to son, uh, kind of uh, who is able and has the qualities as well, and through a consultative process of shura that emphasizes consensus. Very difficult indeed. So history of Islamic rule that reflects both leadership by birth as well as virtues, uh, wise and pious. So that's uh, But succession and socialization are very important. Saudi and Arab Gulf states followed the principle of dynastic rule, combining qualities of leadership marked by also rivalries and contest among the sons. If you look at uh, King Saud and King Faisal bin Abdulaziz had long rivalries. They later emerged because of his uh, leadership abilities, socialization, and performance. So I think uh, that's also been counted in Arab uh, leadership construct. So I think uh, that's one. Gulf examples also reflect a clearly dynastic principle. Jayad bin Nahyan fashioned his family into something comparable to a large political party or party within a one party system. His son Khalifa succeeded him so easily. And then third construct is social and Islamic movements, which are very important now in understanding the resistance groups their emergence, character, and organizational competence. If you look at uh, some of those processes, I think uh, they call it dawa or Islamic call to political leadership. It's a process. Muslim Brotherhood, for a long time, Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, and other groups of activists and terrorists, including Al-Qaeda, follows a new art and process of socialization in schools, institutes, training camps, and across the region socializing, inspiring, and transforming followers. I think uh, the integration of leaders, followers, example. Now, how they really behave in this? Uh, so I just uh, wanted to very quickly understand the behavioral patterns and styles of leadership. So Arab leadership patterns suggest a curious combination of traits and orientation to Arab tradition of family bonds Islamic values and ruling imperatives. A composite leadership structure that doesn't resemble but not fit in, that resemble but doesn't fit into Western construct, construct like authoritarian, dictatorial, or anti democratic. In fact, most of the studies I have seen in comparative politics, about 3.8% of the comparative study uh, on uh, they mainly focus on that categories, authoritarian, authoritarian regime characteristics. But uh, they sometimes do not go into those things. So here, I think three patterns can be discerned if you uh, make it a composite leadership. One is the founding leaders, which is very much orientation to Arab tradition and cultural nationalism, or Arab nationalism, but distinctively and acted as the motivating factor for struggle against Western power. I think this is a powerful message. Military and nationalist leaders and statist modernizers emerged during that process. Gamal Nasser, Abdul Nasser, Hafez Assad, King Hussein, Ben Gurion, Sharon, Begin, Shimon Peri. So all of them developed along Jewish identity or other nationalist identity and democratic process with contradictory behavioral characteristics of ruthlessness and compromise. So I think uh, I talked to many Palestinian leaders. They said Ariel Sharon was very ruthless, one of the most ruthless leaders. But at the same time, he was the most compromising. It's very contradictory, you see. But uh, they get more concessions from him than others, you know. Like Shimon Peres, very difficult. Even he will be saying very soft things. Got Nobel Peace Prize, even. You see. So it's very difficult to judge who will give more compromise, uh, more concession. And then we have. Another category from founding leadership to transitional leadership. This, is also, this also reflects a mix of tradition and modernity. If we look at the track of King Faisal or uh, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia now, they symbolize this pattern of family rule with economic welfare, strong but benevolent. So that's the, the major theme or characteristic. And then Hosni Mubarak, as I said, there's a last book uh, on this, last pharaoh. So he is very strong and ruthless also. 
full state control with limited contestation. Saddam Hussein, of course, very much a legendary dictatorial. And Iran's Ahmad Inazad and Khamenei, ambitious, ideational, and combative leaders. And then final category, which uh, I, have a, uh, I think is a transformational, I said it's a possibility, but uh, not now, is a, when it's a new structure, method, and process like Gulf, Kuwait, Jordan, Iraq, and Lebanon. So they have some possibilities for transformation leadership. As the leaders are opening up for reforms and economic liberalization, aiming for new social and political goals and values, how far it will go, we don't know. We'll uh, talk about. And then I tried in this construct you know, on US influence on political leadership. I thought uh, that is also very much important in the equation of the emergence of leadership or the downfall of leadership. So US strategy in the region for several decades, you know, it's a six decades, was focused on engaging with political leadership in the region, overtly or covertly, sometimes intrusive and interventionist, trying to influence events, situations, developments, in order to realize its economic and strategic goals. Second, US role also facilitated incumbent political leadership, regime, who are allies and friendly, no matter whether they are authoritarian or repressive. In fact, its so-called pragmatic policy that aimed at stability at the expense of democracy provided longevity to these leaders to provide military economic assistance, diplomatic and political support. Bush's aggressive rhetoric of freedom agenda supported the creation of a big program, MEPI, Middle East Partnership Initiative Program. But as Iraq's situation deteriorated, democratic wave receded after its peak in 2005. Third is US strategy by default encouraged radicalization of leadership in the region. US invasion to topple Saddam's leadership in Iraq led to Iran's influence and rise, brought fatigue in the peace process between Israel and Palestine, discouraged democratic reforms, and social and economic liberalization created a new and uncertain leadership trajectory. And fourth, American failed attempts to transform the Middle East in the past decade, particularly Clinton through peace and Bush through war. Now President Obama picked up where Bush left off, trying to find new ways of engaging with the region and its leadership by his own style and strategy, which is unfolding but yet to bring results in peace and security arena and political reform. Now, I just have a very quick uh, uh, run-up on the performance, the legacy of the leadership, current leadership. So why, what legacies are left by this, uh, what I call, transitional leaders of the Arab world on which the future leaders can build? These can be looked in three areas of their performance across the region. So I just, uh, for convenience, I just uh, put three. One is the peace and security, because that's the number one stake in the region. And I just want to ask, is the Arab world more secure today than, say, a decade ago? Is the two-state solution for Israel and Palestine possible? Or will it remain a sad cliche in the face of Israeli obstinate position on settlement and military intrusion and raids? Will Hamas concede its demand of right of return and self-defense? Yasser Arafat, the legendary leader of the Palestinian, took 15 years to sell the state solution to his people, but failed to realize it in his lifetime. Mahmoud Abbas doesn't have that charisma or support of the people. His Fatah has lost considerable strength, and it is difficult to dislodge Hamas in the face of increasing radicalization. So peace process goes nowhere. And this paralysis may escalate violence, terrorism, suicide bombing to destabilize the region again. 
And then third, the leaders are increasingly skeptical, the Arab actors, like Saudi Arabia, has already distanced itself from the sea with its new strategic priority vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Egypt is maintaining its tight balance, sticking to peace deal with Israel and facilitating talks between Palestine and Israel. Syria is more inward looking and now at a low key in connection with Hezbollah and anti-Israeli posture. Lebanon is more focused on its stability running a complicated coalition government, and Jordan's role remains limited to peaceful efforts. The second legacy is the new power balance, which uh, I thought uh, is important that uh, in the region, Iranian leadership versus Arab world. So I think there is uh, going to be another uh, axis there. Three decades after Ayatollah Khomeini, a uh, picture of uh, revolution Islam, a new balance seems to be emerging in the Middle East, where Iran has become a powerful actor. This was facilitated by US invasions in Iraq, one, first Gulf War, and more significantly by the occupation of Iran in 2003. Oil, but, and particularly coupled with its oil power and strong ideological Islamic and Shia identities, extending to Iraq, Lebanon, Gulf, Palestine, Iran has more clout and geopolitical advantages now to tilt the balance in its favor. Iran's ambitions to become a nuclear power also enhanced its prestige in the region, notwithstanding economic cost and political isolation affected by UN sanctions. Iran's future success is not assured. It's in a flux. And much will depend how its political leadership meets the current challenges and sustain its position vis-a-vis -vis regional developments, like what, uh, how Israel will act, how Saudi Arabia will take a stand, and how Egypt will come in the future. And also international pressures coming mainly from the United States. So I think uh, Iran, Palestine, and non-state actors like Hamas, Hezbollah, will be important in future peace and American counterterrorism prospects in the Middle East to a great extent. And third, I think I tried to evaluate some of the in, uh, performance in terms of economic cooperation and reforms. And, and here I think Gulf leadership is very important. Despite family lineage and rivalries, related directly to the ebb and flow of powers across the Gulf states, there is a tremendous push for economic cooperation and development dynamism, including redistributive measures that reflect benevolent leadership. GCC, Arab League, and other regional and sub-regional cooperative arrangements are being encouraged now to create more financial and investment linkages across the region and beyond yet to gain momentum, but have strong potential in the future if the region remains peaceful. China's entry through this route for energy and economic cooperation via they call the new Silk Road may have significant implication for the region. Now, last in concluding, I just want to see future outlook. So what's the outlook? So here I think I have I tried to say that Middle East is at the crossroads now, intersected by three paths. One, statist, positional, family-based, dynastic political leaders with vast networks of patronage, enhanced resources at their disposal, and developing robust mechanisms of control and influence. The second stream or paths is the societal Islamic leadership coming through mobilization of radical forces and movements, enjoying broad popular support with social service network and communication. Iranian leadership is an exceptional manifestation of this ideational political Islam. And third stream is the liberal, secular, and reformist leaders caught between the two poles, active in promoting 
ideational and institutional structures of democratic state with accountability of leadership, participatory processes, and reducing gender and social equality, inequalities. Now, these three groups, all these groups are now exposed to technology, electronic media, like Al Jazeera, CNN, and other networks of communication to mobilize their followers. Through the, though the future will be determined by powers, especially the by the contextual, critical contextual factors which I hinted, the economic condition, social deprivation, and the role of outside power, especially the United States. Indeed, the shape of future leadership in the Middle East will depend considerably on the ingenuity of US policy and strategy that need serious reconsideration given its past record of failed diplomacy and squandered opportunities. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Professor Rahman, for uh, quite a comprehensive uh, survey of uh, leadership in the region. I expect there are many uh, questions. I have a few myself. Um, uh, and while I'm waiting to see people's hands, uh, let me ask one. But the procedure will be basically, if you wouldn't mind stepping to the microphone and identifying yourself and then um, making a, a concise comment or, or raising a question, that would be fine to give uh, Dr. Rahman uh, sufficient time to answer. But let me start with uh, a question that uh, occurred to me as you were going along. Uh, do you think, uh, I, I thought your, your last, uh, your, your three types of intersecting leadership is quite, quite interesting, but I'm wondering um, who's on top or uh, which one of these trends, uh, in your opinion, seems to be the dominant one? There certainly is a widespread opinion that the Islamist trend uh, is on top or is, is, is going that direction, um, but I wonder if, if, uh, if you agree with that. So I wondered if you could perhaps elaborate a little bit on which of these trends strikes you as the most robust. Um, so please. Yeah. Should I? Yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Hudson. I think uh, that's uh, very you know, uh, difficult, but uh, that's the most important question, you see, the which way the future holds. But if we look at uh, the leadership, because I just uh, as the driving force of change, then I think uh, the outcome will be resolved through a dynamic process of interaction. And this is the paradox, you know, this, uh, the change come through, uh, change come through resolving a dialectic, it's a kind of dialectic. So I think all the forces are now in the field, you see. So if, uh, I don't predict that uh, one particular track will prevail, but uh, the, but if you look at uh, some of the profound changes that is happening, the U.S. is already behind. You see, they always uh, try to underestimate the societal forces. You know, they are always concentrating on state-level political leadership. They just uh, so I think uh, uh, past solution will not be adequate now. So I think, but U.S. strategy, that's why I just put it in connection that this will depend on the ingenuity, whether the U.S. can relate to the region, uh, particularly the dynamics of social forces in new ways, and find the solutions there, you see. And I think uh, uh, there is a great saying that yesterday's uh, outsiders will be tomorrow's players, insiders. So it may happen, but uh, nobody will have the uh, all or nothing game. So it will be a kind of uh, no zero sum game. So uh, I think it will be shared kind of leadership. So that might uh, most probably emerge in the future. Let me follow up on that just for a second because uh, you, you talked in the title of your talk about uh, uh, transitions and transformations and so forth. But I'm, I'm thinking that as I look at, the, at these three types, 
um, if you were to argue that the first type, which you call uh, status positional family-based <coughs> leadership, uh, is in fact the dominant type, I'm, not, I'm still not quite clear what you think about that, but if you were to think that it's the dominant type, couldn't you argue that there's no transition at all, and there's certainly no transformation, but rather there's a kind of a retraditionalization of leadership reflected perhaps in the fact that in several cases we've seen uh, in uh, nominally Republican uh, governments uh, uh, sons being handed the mantle of leadership from their fathers. But if you were to say that the second type, which is, is sort of this, this Islamist um, uh, type, which certainly uh, would seem from their ideological statements to claim uh, a sort of a transformational kind of agenda, then you might say, well, no, we're, we're really on the cusp of, of something really, really big here. And as for the third type, well, again, I'm curious whether you think that these guys are even in the game. Now, I think uh, what I'm trying, uh, that uh, the transition has, is occurring and uh, it's a continuous process of change. Because uh, if you look at uh, some of the contestants, you know, like uh, recently the Egypt, for example, it's, it's not easy to succeed for Gamal Mubarak because there will be contestants, you know, like Al Baradi has now come up and also trying to uh, integrate the forces who are contesting the regime. You see? So I think in ev everywhere there is now contestation. I think that's a challenge. You see, both from the society as well as from the third track, uh, who are, you said, outsiders, but a kind of uh, quasi-democratic uh, structure, which is also emerging, you see. They may, not, they may not get the whole democratic process, but at least there will be some compromise. And it may come in some of the areas, like, uh, but yes, those are steeped into the high tradition, like family-based in the Gulf and others, they will be a bit difficult. Because they are, as I said, uh, as I argued, that uh, this uh, type of regimes, because the population is small and uh, strong networks of patronage and influence, and also, third, that the capacities of the regime or the leadership is very high. So they are going more for redistributive welfare measures that may contain for some time, that may resist change for some time, but in the end, uh, it much will depend on the deprivations within the society. So the bigger states are already in trouble. But uh, smaller ones who have more capacity, more revenues and less population, they can resolve the problem and resist the change for some more time. So, that's, uh, so I don't okay. give a very clear you know, deadline. But some are, you can see, like uh, I can tell you very clearly, uh, even in Saudi Arabia, uh, in, uh, in Egypt, in uh, uh, Syria, in many of the regimes, people are now thinking, you see. Uh, I'm not saying that it's influencing. There's also demonstration effect, you see, that what they are really, what legacies they are, you know, to, on which the futures can build. What is the prospect for the mobilized people? So that will be a, a problem. Okay, well, I think let's, let's open it up for some comments from the floor. I'm, I'm going, I, I don't mean to put the ambassador of Kuwait on the spot, but I, I'm wondering if at some point he might want to make a comment himself on, on uh, some aspect of Professor Rahman's speech. But I, I, won't, I won't call on you, but if you feel so inclined, uh, we would be very, most interested in your views. In the meantime, let me, uh, I, I see um, um, Ambassador Chowdhury, and, and we have, I think, several other hands. So, so uh, please come up, uh, just briefly introduce yourself, uh, and then... Uh, my name is Iftikhar Chowdhury, uh, Senior uh, Research Fellow at the, uh, uh, at the Institute of South, South Asian Studies, but formerly of Bangladesh, was Foreign Minister of Bangladesh at one point in time. I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Atar Rahman for what uh, what I feel was an extremely useful analysis of, of leadership in, 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 in the Middle East. This is something that, uh, that enjoys the focus, attention of much of the world today. And an analysis of the type that you have made uh, is a very useful input 
for both the academia and the public uh, policy stream. Uh, I just have one or two comments to make, uh, uh, probably a question as well. Uh, one comment is uh, 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 the, the, the political philosophy of kingship in the Middle East was somewhat different from that uh, we, uh, as was known in Europe, because uh, the Middle Eastern kings did not have the kind of divine right that the European kings had. I mean, the authority did not flow from, from God. Here, it was actually, ironically, more democratic, because here, authority flows from the family or from the tribal, tribal leadership. So there was some kind of a consensual agreement on who the leader is going to be. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the title king is usually avoided for that very reason, and, uh, and King Abdullah would much rather be known as the custodian of the two holy places uh, uh, than, than his majesty, the, the king. And the other sheikhs uh, would rather be addressed as uh, highness than, than as, 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 as majesty, of course. You say that they are the driving force of change. But there could be an alternative opinion, which is uh, the strong leadership actually impedes change and, uh, 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 and institution building in the polity, as the result of which, as the result of which, uh, any uh, change would come from uh, some either other ideological uh, 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 front, such as Islamism. You see, it's because there is no simple method of effective effecting change through uh, institutional mechanisms. So my question is, do you agree with this? Uh, that uh, uh, unless there is institution building, unless this strong leadership is directed towards creating institutions in the community and society, change will be violent. Thank you, sir. Can I just... Uh, <coughs> of course. Sure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Choudhury. I think uh, you have a lot of experience also in the Arab world, you see. Uh, in answer to your question, I think that's very important. Uh, I just remember when I was studying Gamal Abdul Nasser, the great uh, Arab leader, so popular, you know, even Yasser Arafat. But they couldn't hold, you know, because uh, the lack of institutions. They could not institutionalize the power or legitimize through institutions. You see, so the legacy could not last. And even if you look at uh, some of the younger generation of the Egyptian, they forgot the Arab, uh, the call for Arab nationalism. You see, we remember, you know. But uh, and uh, those who are older than us, they remember. You see, the great Arab leaders, you know. But uh, uh, so I think uh, that is another step of transition. You see, that uh, leaders now, and this has been realized by some of the. So the state and also uh, the Gulf states, you know, not <coughs> political institution, but then making more social inst But sometimes the Gulf states make a kind of charitable institutions, not really political participatory process, but they have also a political party as an institution. But uh, the participatory process is limited, and they can influence. And uh, many of the contests within the Gulf is resolved through you know, a kind of carrot and stick policy. You give more carrot, you know, uh, use influence to win over, and uh, sometimes, of course, uh, the repression, or you, know, you sanitize. So that's another way of, but I agree with you, that in the end, uh, political leadership by itself cannot sustain. The legacy is also uh, is more long-lasting or enduring if they can put it through the like uh, even king abdul aziz i just uh, because i read uh, um, because of my experience so the arabia could not be so much institutionalized as uh, king faisal who made elaborate uh, uh, this uh, we call saudi state as an institution even in kuwait for example now they are getting more institutionalized you see but if you look at uh, the early first generation the Sabah, he was very different, but he was a great, courageous leader. So I think that is also a transition, you see, that institutionalized leadership. And this has been done also through social mobilization by the new groups. You know, like Hezbollah is so powerful. Why? Because they have strong institutional and also people's legitimacy. Uh, you will be surprised that 97% of the uh, Shiites in Lebanon believe that Hezbollah is doing a good work. They support Hezbollah. This is amazing. 
So I think in the end, uh, the leader followership relationship, if they're institutionalized, as you said correctly, you see through state institution, so more participatory structure and uh, other uh, institution, then you get better result and enduring performance and uh, result. Thank you very much for Thank that. You. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, please. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm Diane Jatalika, Visiting Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies. And until last year, Sri Lanka's Ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva. Uh, as a political scientist by profession and perhaps vocation, I must congratulate uh, Professor Rachman on the excellence of his uh, analysis and his typology. Uh, two queries, really. One is about the third point uh, of, of the slide that's up there. Uh, to, to borrow from uh, Professor Hudson, the, uh, you, uh, your identification of liberal, secular, and reformist leaders, uh, I, who do you have in mind? Uh, can you give us some examples? Uh, and uh, is it possible that uh, these leaders can broaden their appeal by uh, a greater recourse to uh, populism uh, rather than remain uh, as, as narrow and, and weak, uh, weak weeds, as it were. Uh, so this is, uh, this is my, my first question. Uh, the, the second is to do with your, the second point up there, the societal and Islamic leadership. Um, both Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, more Hezbollah than Hamas, have brought one other factor into the mix, and that is electoral politics, or if you like, democracy. Uh, so these are uh, ex uh, ideologically extremist, uh, perhaps tactically extremist movements, but which have, uh, in a way, greater democratic legitimacy than some uh, far more status quo leaderships. Uh, th this is another one of your paradoxes. Uh, so, uh, sorry, though I said two questions, there's a third and final one. It's to do with an absence in this typology. Uh, I was wondering why you had not mentioned um, a particular trend which has now seemed to di have died out. That is a radicalism, which was anti-imperialist, if you like, or anti-Western, but also secular, modernist. And I refer to a trend which uh, uh, and included uh, see the original Baathist, Michael Aflac and his ideology, the Arab national movement, uh, and of course the radical left that came out of the ANM, uh, George Habash, Naif Avatme, uh, and that tendency of the PFLP, uh, PDFLP, and so on. Why is it that uh, that trend within the movements has virtually evaporated? Can it be purely because of the Cold War? Because in Latin America, you see a reactivation of the left. In parts of Asia, the left never really went away, though it was reduced. What is it in the Middle East that has caused uh, a near total evaporation of that secular, radical, uh, anti-imperialist movement or tendency? Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I think uh, this is a very good uh, question, but uh, I think uh, I could uh, get it also from the one is uh, that uh, you said that uh, virtually whether there is any political space for, we said it, uh, for these uh, moderating groups. I think there is, you see. Uh, and for example, I'm just saying that uh, like Egypt, one case is very clear. So like uh, this election is rejected. Next year's election is rejected by all parties except uh, National Democratic Party because Al Baradi, uh, he has formed a non-partisan association because he did. He doesn't want to float a party so quickly, but he wanted to first uh, uh, put all the factions within or followers within a particular umbrella. So I think, uh, but there is a political space, and in, as a political scientist, I can assure you that if there is a political space, it will not be remain vacant. You know, or yeah. So there will be some leadership will come. You see, so I think there is a possibility that, uh, and uh, that either two extremes people always try to avoid, but that doesn't. Uh, uh, also, your second point, 
uh, counteract my second point, which is uh, that strong mobilization across Islamic lines, or radicalization, because that is also happening in parallel. And if you look at uh, American policy, you see, because they know that if uh, there is a clear democratic electoral politics there, then these uh, groups will come up. Like if you now free Muslim Brotherhood <coughs> in Egypt, they are going to come, you see, along with other, uh, and they are going to, and even if you look at uh, in Jordan, which you know, is, which is also a, a political a, a Islamic group, you know, but of a Muslim Brotherhood, uh, is a local chapter in Jordan. They have so many followers, you know. And if you look at the parliament, they talk, but they don't have the effective power, you see. But they have so many members from the parliament. And if you look at the past bit, you know, in case of Algeria and even in Palestine, in case of Hamas, they won in 2006, but then they were not allowed to continue because, uh, so the, even if you open up democratic process, the, and that's why U.S. delayed the democratic process, but that through the process, these guys are going to come because they have a vast networks of social mobilization and institutions, and they may come through kind of uh, coalition politics or you know, uh, giving some moderation, and, but they can also unite against the uh, uh, incumbent regimes. So I think the, so your point is well taken there, you see that, uh, and also went to Western people, because those who are talking about the Western interest, uh, and the people think that uh, they don't inspire the people on the streets. They said, oh, they're talking because they have to talk, because they have the, uh, I think this is a serious uh, legitimacy. And uh, as I uh, scanned through Professor Hudson's book, you know, that this dilemma in politics remains ever, that which way to go? the political dilemmas in the Arab world. You know, I think this is very important. And these dilemmas are faced in a different uh, way uh, and through the interaction of the different forces. So thank you very much for it. The final point was the uh, a &M, uh, Oh, yes. Uh, I think uh, you are right. But uh, this was a time, as the context is changing, the extreme, the Baathist are now slowly uh, giving uh, or paving the way for new type of uh, socialist. So who are not, uh, so the old socialists uh, virtually lost their uh, you know, support in the society. I think that's part of the reason. Even some of the reforms in the Baathist party, if you look at, including Syria, they're just changing the composition more, particularly Assad is doing more, bringing the tribal groups who are akin to his family or tribal groups and changing the composition of the party, the ruling party as well. So I think uh, there's less influence of the radical socialist, uh, as you were uh, talking, in Arab society now. OK, uh, yes, please. <clears throat> Professor Rockman, <clears throat> thank you very much for your talk. My name is Dusty Clayton um, from US Embassy, but uh, I'm not in a position to comment on US policy in the Middle East, more of an Asia person myself. Um, I thought your talk was very interesting, and I have two follow-up questions. Um, one is, to what extent in the Middle East do you think that certain leaders are setting the trend uh, or leading what will become the trend of future leaders in the Middle East? I mean, to what extent are there certain more influential leaders that you think are going to have a greater impact over what um, you know more leaders turn out to be, mm -hmm. given that it's a very heterogeneous region. Mm -hmm. And then second is, to what extent do you think Middle Eastern leadership and future leaders are being influenced by models of leadership they see elsewhere in the world? Not just the United States, but I mean Singapore, uh, China, um, other countries um, around the world that Middle Eastern countries are saying, hey, if we want to maybe Scandinavia, I don't know, like Norway, for example, where Halso is a very oil rich country dealing with, you know, where they create this big social net. Uh, what, what are the models for a successful uh, 
you know, country that um, are having some impact. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clayton. I think uh, that's a very good question, particularly. Uh, like, uh, I would say, or I would argue that uh, the most influential leadership, uh, particularly the new types, which uh, the younger generation, because as I said, uh, if you look at the demography of this region, uh, particularly the Gulf states, you see, uh, they are following a very dynamic model, you see, because they know where their deficit is, but they're trying to overcome that deficit through a new kind of leadership, you see, more entrepreneurial, more uh, economic uh, focused, and uh, more, you know, the business leader or corporate leaders, and also a kind of uh, through a vast network of distributive mechanisms, you see. So I think they are the models, you see. In the Arab world, you know, as you know, and as, as I lived, you see, the younger people are very vibrant, you see. The way they talk, and they were they want to enjoy the world. You see, they don't go by these old uh, models of leadership. You see, they, but they need you know a new sensitization or you know follow ups of certain models. So they like that, uh, but it's also constricted, you know, because uh, they can't all are not Gulf. You see, so even if you look at Yemen, you see, uh, such a, if you look at Egypt, the uh, most populous, say, 81 million people. You see, and the biggest economy in a sense, and uh, also, uh, but uh, handicapped by the repressive uh, and also uh, the institutional mechanisms of control. So they can't really come up. And uh, this is Saudi Arab Arabia is also very smart. Kuwait is also very smart because they are doing the socialization process in terms of education and sensitization of the new leadership norms and values. You see, which are coming on this entrepreneurial model, you see, which are coming to a corporatist model, you see. And also, to an extent, uh, they want to counter this uh, as a social model, not political, which is still sensitive to many parts of the world. And the second is that uh, whether they will follow. No, uh, they're not going to follow uh, the Western model, you see, particularly in some of the countries. But they all know that uh, they are following the Western model. You see, because, uh, but they don't want to show, you see, that uh, Western meaning, you know, that uh, we are following only. But if you look at uh, some of them, like uh, in Dubai, uh, most of the universities are having cooperation with uh, uh, the um, uh, American universities. And they have also a corporate leadership academy or institute, which is cooperating with uh, um, uh, Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, or other university, the Wharton School and other things. So they talk uh, big things, you know, in a sense. And also, they have the money, so they can bridge that. So I think, uh, uh, but in terms of political leadership, they're not to say that we follow the American model. So they're not going to make a presidential system, a lot of control over their structures and their political leadership or accountability. So those are the things uh, still a Greek in Arab world, you know, so like account accountability. Oh my God, who is accountable to whom? You see, I was in Morocco just my uh, from my personal experience, and I thought uh, state belongs to whom? The concept of people is still nebulous. You know, there is no concept of people. It's all kings. You see, so that's not uh, radically changed, but uh, the process is there. So that what we call a kind of uh, the process of transformation. It's not uh, easy, it's not coming mm, so quickly, but it will. But uh, that's the last thing, political leadership. So thank you very much. Mm. Yes, um, yes, no, um, behind Mr. Talib and then, and then Mr. Talib. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, my name is Ang Sin Hock. I am doing business. Uh, on the question of model, uh, perhaps I think uh, if you can comment on uh, the Turkish mo mo model, if it's useful for the Middle West, uh, for the Middle East countries to sort of uh, study and, if, if possible, to learn lessons from that. Uh, I didn't put uh, uh, that uh, Turkish or uh, that uh, Turkey in the, uh, the Middle East, you know, but uh, it uh, affects the Middle East, you know. Yeah, but 
uh, first they are not Arabs, you know. So there is a strong uh, content of Arab nationalism or on linguistic Arabs, you know. I think uh, there's also, but still, like Yemenis, you know, uh, people want to uh, dismiss Yemeni, but they are the Arabs, so they can't dismiss them, you see. Uh, so the content of Arab, you know, the linguistic uh, is, is also very powerful, you see. And uh, if you look at uh, some of the eloquent speeches of the leaders, the way they speak, you see, they emerged more from demagogy and also eloquent speech, you see. So I think, uh, you have to understand that uh, the Turkish model will not inspire, you see. It's a kind of, uh, but it may, uh, in a sense, uh, craft it into the process, you know, like uh, make a compromise. And uh, I would argue that uh, it's a hybrid leadership. It may come, but in a different frame or different uh, way, you see, or different mode. So not now, you see. So uh, I don't know, you see, that, uh, a Turkish model will inspire, you see. But uh, Turkish is a rising power, but uh, not inspiring for the Arabs. You know, I think uh, Erdogan is um, one of the most popular leaders in the Arab in world, the Arab world yeah. uh, today, in a, in a strange sort of historical reversal. Um, and that's sort of interesting. Uh, but, but also, I, I think, uh, and maybe this was the gist of your question, the, uh, what Turkey seems to represent, and I'm sure this is being watched very carefully in the Arab world, is the uh, uh, establishment of uh, what I guess, for want of a better word, we would call a moderate uh, Islamist mm -hmm. party, uh, having come to power through democratic Process. means. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is interesting because, of course, there's a huge debate, as, as I think we all know, in the Arab world uh, that over inclusion or exclusion of Islamist groups. And there's a strong feeling, particularly among incumbent elites, that you know, if you if if one Islamist group gets its foot in the door, you know, that's the end. It's going to become a caliphate. It's going to become you know a Taliban state, and so on and so on. And other people say, no, uh, it doesn't have to be that way. I look at the Turkish case. But at any rate, uh, it, it, I, think, I think from a political scientist's point of view, it's an interesting uh, uh, and much uh, watched uh, experiment that's going on in Turkey right now. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Talib. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Saladin Talib. Uh, I used to be a member of parliament in Yemen. And I, want, I wanted to call myself among the liberal, secular, and reformist leaders. <laughs> but <laughs> as a professor has put it, uh, are they really, uh, are they really uh, uh, do, do they have a place, actually? I say this. Uh, I just want a short comment, and then I want to put the, the, the question. First, I congratulate you on, on delving into a very, very complex matter. Uh, it's completely uncharted, I think. But I just want to put the first question is, is the resistance to a transformation in the Arab world, is it by accident or is it by design? Uh, I contend it is by design. Uh, not only are the current leadership or systems uh, resistant, the resistance comes from also receives support from international powers. As uh, Professor Rahman rightly put it, it's, it's very important how much the US, US policy influences the change that happens in the Middle East. Uh, especially in the regimes. They are very, very sensitive to that. I say this, I must uh, give an anecdote here. Uh, I was very close to the elections in Yemen in 2006 for the for presidential election. Uh, there was the incumbent president and against uh, a representative or a nominee for the co uh, coalition of opposition parties. And this coalition consists of the Islamists, 
and it consists of the uh, socialists socialist. and uh, including the nationalists. And they agreed on one independent. Uh, at that time, the leader of the Islamic party was in sick, uh, on deathbed, actually, in Riyadh. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah, who was practically, possibly, arguably, the most uh, influential man in Yemen at that time. He was the tribal leader, or tribal supreme leader. He was forced, apparently, by the Saudi ruling family to actually declare his support for the incumbent president. Although the nominee was a nominee of his party. Number two, another leader from the South who had been in exile for, six, for a number of years since the 94 war and lived in Saudi Arabia, three days before the election, was forced to come back to Yemen and declare his support for the incumbent president. Number three, two days before the election, the government of Yemen was able to give away one month's salary to all people, to all everybody who receives a salary from the government. $300 million, which they didn't have, but completely funded, one billion rials, I remember correctly, by Saudi Arabia, for one reason. Why was this done? Saudi Arabia is just, I think, panicky that not even a change of, uh, of leader will happen even something closely competitive. And they went ahead to sabotage, in fact, a real open and free uh, election. And I, I, I must add also that the same thing was shared also in Egypt, in Syria, and in many other parts of the earth. Therefore, there are actually the current leaderships are coming together, supporting each other's continuity, and resisting any change or reform. Of course, the United States policy is, was at first, uh, as I remember, when President Bush, uh, just after 9-11, uh, he said, it's democracy. The problem is democracy. The Middle East it doesn't have democracy, and it must have democracy in order for terrorism not to exist. Of course, the first result of democracy was Hamas, and it was completely canceled. This is against the backdrop, of course, if you remember the first free elections in Algeria, when the Islamists won, and again, the elections were canceled. So the people in the Middle East are disillusioned, they are frustrated, and they are being choked by current regimes. And not, not just by the current regimes there, but I, I, I should think also by other interested forces in the world who are scary, who are scared of, uh, of seeing real change or uncharted change that may happen in the Middle East. This has really, really demoralized the forces that may lead Oh, one more anecdote, a small one, then I'll, I'll shut up. Baradi. You mentioned Baradi. You know what happened recently with Baradi? His daughter, his daughter's pictures in swimsuits were published just to discredit him in the public eye in Egypt. They were published in the internet and newspapers in Egypt. In the beach. In, 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 she was in, in uh, uh, he, Mr. Baradi's daughter, she, she, had, uh, she was just getting married or something, but she, there were pictures of her in a swimsuit, and we can understand what that means in the Middle East. They were published just to discredit the man. So he is more or less really out of the, out of the game now. And, uh, and again, the, 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 so therefore, the current successions that we see in the republics, in the republics, at least in three current uh, republics, will be was intended to be father to son, which is a uh, back to uh, uh, a devastating form of traditionalist, and which which creates more frustration with the Arabs who are who are not 
getting delivery from their governments today. And therefore, uh, is there a question in all this? I don't know. I leave the questions to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. No, I agree with you. You see that uh, this is a dilemma, <clears throat> and uh, it will be resolved uh, through a process. But uh, it's not easy, you know. But uh, in case of Egypt, uh, this uh, event will not uh, go so easy uh, because the society, you know, the challenges are coming, and it will be contested. You know, so if you say that uncontested regimes, that's wrong. You see, but. You have to resolve it, you know, because of the dominant power category. The state is still uh, dominated by this uh, existing leadership. So it's not, it's a contest there. And about American, uh, if, if you say that Americans sometimes, as they say, by default you see, of its policy, not uh, necessarily by, you know, inducing or encouraging a particular type, you know, but. Uh, uh, they are uh, always behind in understanding the social dynamics to, to some areas, you see, and rely more on the political leaders who are very close to them. So that's the problem, you see. And uh, they don't allow the change, you know, because they know that uh, the change may, you know, backfire, you know. And so this is a more status quo uh, uh, approach, you see. So we, I thought uh, in the end that uh, much depends on how U.S. evolves its policy whether it's a changed, a more inclusive type of uh, strategy or not in the future. Okay. We have time probably for two more brief questions or comments. So, uh, yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Mrs. Tan Chikel, formerly from the Computer Center of NUS. Professor Rahman, thank you for giving us a very interesting insight into the Middle East. Now, in your presentation, you highlighted three very capable and successful women. Um, from what I read and from what I see on television, the Middle East appears to be very much male-dominated. What kind of a role do you think the women in the Middle East will play in the future Middle East? And for women thinking of taking on political leadership roles, can you share with us your views on what are some of the obstacles <coughs> and challenges they are li likely to face? Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. I think uh, this is very important because uh, I had the opportunity to train a group of entrepreneurs in the Middle East. You know, uh, there are eight, including some minors as well. You know, and. Uh, I found them very enterprising and uh, very ambitious, and they want to do something, and very vibrant as well. But uh, the problem is that uh, when they go to the harsh realities of the politics, you know, is a kind of forbidden, you know, place. You know, that's that is an attitude still holding. Look at Kuwait, which is uh, trying to open up, and. Uh, the conservative forces, the traditional forces are there every day to say what type of dress you are talking. So they are booing he, her, you know, that uh, please put your dress, you know, the old way, you see. But she is putting perfectly all right, as you saw, you know, with the suit and everything, you know. So this is the, the structure. So there must be, that's why I'm saying there must be a sea change. So it's not by force. It's not by uh, only institutional change, but also a kind of uh, uh, psychosocial changes you know, in the minds of the people. And that can come only through vigorous socialization and education process. It's good that uh, Middle East universities and institutions are coming, you see, a more open way. So they need more interactions with other people of the world. You see, and uh, uh, even you know this type of things, you know, is, is, is a relic of the past. You know, but they're still there wearing, and they think this is important. So as I said, that beyond institution, beyond people, there must be also this change in the mindset, and in the sea change must be there, in particularly in a male-dominated society or tribal society with strong, you know. A male uh, domination is very difficult to change. You know? So I think uh, that will come through empowerment process, uh, which is not, which is coming, but very slow. 
you see. So please don't expect so quickly it will be transformed into Singaporean model, you see. Or, you know, so, and like Kuwait is opening up, but they're getting resistance, but they're still endorsing. And it's good that even Kuwait's top leadership, I'm not uh, pleasing him, but uh, they have a point that uh, any minister must be endorsed or confirmed by the parliament. So if you can appoint somebody or nominate somebody as a minister, but they, he, he or she must be confirmed by the parliament. And this is a very uh, rigorous process, you know, uh, which is good. You know, it's coming. The change is coming. And, uh, but it's very slow in case of women uh, empowerment and the uh, process of bringing them particularly into politics, but not in other areas. In many other areas, women are coming up and uh, not behind. Okay, uh, we have time, I'm afraid, only for one more question. I think I saw a hand in the back. Um, and then um, I'll invite those who were not able to raise their Professor, questions to join Arson. us. Uh, she has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, well, well uh, maybe, maybe during the break uh, other people can ask questions. No, but yes, please. Yes. My name is Shohit. I'm from Institute of South Asian Studies. Uh, uh, my one is more uh, comment than question. I thought it was a very fascinating study, and uh, it has uh, huge implications. And one of these is demography. With my economics background, I look at demography quite closely. As you speak, there has been a huge demographic transition happening. As you know, that West is declining in terms of population, and there is a rise of population in Muslim countries. If you look at the uh, Muslim world, they are the most young. And unfortunately, half of the Muslim countries are falling into demographic, what economist or demographer calls the demographic trap, hmm. that you are not uh, having that successful demographic transition. That's why the rise of non-state actors and all these things. And I, I myself is doing a small study, what I call the terrorism's demographic window of opportunity. So that's where the Middle, Middle East leadership is so important, because when you talk about Islamic world's leadership, it naturally goes to Middle East. So as you are, as the West is not allowed uh, democracy to function there, then we see the two trends are coming up, one led by Turkey, who used to be more secular, but going aligning to the different path. So is Iran. So, and, and the second force is the non-state actors. So uh, I wonder whether uh, the changes that you are not anticipating uh, in the foreseeable future. But uh, my view is with this uh, region, the change might be uh, uh, in the near future than a uh, than few decades uh, far from now. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much. I think uh, demography is very important for Middle East uh, because uh, you are right, uh, nobody studied it very carefully. You see how it goes into, but uh, one is the women. Of course, uh, if you go to some of the Arab countries, the women are changing a lot in terms of societal power, you know, the way they dress and uh, not necessarily this uh, stereotyping of women. You see, that's true. Another is the young, young people. It's vibrant with all young people. Below 14 is now almost 40%. And below 24 is 55% or 52%, something like that, in 2008 uh, uh, census. So if you look at uh, those statistics, you know, the things are changing. And if you take a survey, you, know, uh, you will be amazed to see that uh, what these uh, people want, really. They want to catch up with the West. They want to enjoy the fruits of life, you know, modern living. They not want to go to this traditional, you know, way these uh, uh, people used to live, you see. So I think this is a problem in the Arab world. There's a lot of changes uh, in the minds of the people, but the reality didn't change because of the rulers. So I think this is the contradiction or the cruel paradox. That's why I say that political leadership itself is a paradox whether they need any leadership or not, you see. I think it's better off not to have leadership, you see. Because then, the, you know, the things, but the leaders are the, they're putting lead onto the people, you see. I think uh, that's uh, uh, it's my reading. And I think uh, that's why change is uh, difficult because the state is grafted on them, you see. The institution, the mukhabarat, you see, they are so 
the famous, you know, intelligence agencies. I never know. We had intelligence agencies, very powerful, but uh, I never saw in. And then another thing which you said uh, very well in a wider mood, that why Iran and Turkey now coming as examples or models to follow? Because there is no Arab country which is following, to be followed. Look at Saudi Arabia. It changed, but in terms of uh, uh, civic rights, women's rights, gender equality, they're still much behind. They just want to make uh, that let other people eat, you know, some welfare content, but not really in terms of human poverty, which is still very much there. But look at Iran. Iran is faster in terms of social benefits. And Iran has uh, this uh, rhetoric, you see. And uh, I just heard, I forgot exactly this uh, Ayatollah Ruhullah Khomeini's big speech that uh, we want a leadership that can get rid of the exploitation and oppressions and injustice and to get rid of poverty. Poverty, you see, it's a very powerful force, you see. And Iranian women are still much ahead in other. Turkey, of course, uh, because of its cultural differences, Turkish model is still a kind of uh, anathema. But uh, still, I think uh, they may come up uh, in, in the future. But I don't know. But thank you for sensitizing us on this demographic uh, revolution. I said it, but uh, uh, it can be really into the um, um, linked into, into the evolution of new leadership or the development of new leadership in the region. Thank you very much. Well, I think on that note, I'd like to uh, uh, ask us all to uh, join in thanking uh, Dr. Rahman for his lecture. And uh, I hope that I'm sorry that those of you that didn't have a chance to raise a question uh, didn't have a chance, but you will have a chance if you can stick around for a cup of tea and perhaps uh, if uh, Dr. Rahman uh, can stay with us a little bit, you can talk to him uh, face to face. So thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.